We have made it to Luke chapter 5 and verse 27. Luke chapter 5 and verse 27. I've actually preached this pass uh, this story here, uh, but I I preached Matthew's account of this story, and uh, today I'm going to preach Luke's account of this story since we've been going like as I said verse by verse through uh, the gospel according to to Luke. So Luke chapter five verse twenty seven. If you found that, would you please stand and honor and respect for the reading of the word of God? It says. And after these things he went forth and saw a publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of custom, and he said unto him, Follow me. And he left all and rose up and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his own house. And there was a great company of publicans and of others that sat down with them, but their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do ye eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Father, in the precious name of Jesus, again I come to you, asking you for what I can't borrow or obtain on my own. I ask you for power from on high to preach, thus saith the Lord. Lord, I ask that all of you and none of me be involved in your message. And I ask if any of me gets involved in it, that you'll sit me down and hush me. Lord, I pray that you'll just use this message for your glory. Lord, I love you, and I thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. There was a famous preacher years ago named Phillips Brooks. And Dr. Brooks was dying. And he did not allow uh, any visitors to come and see him. He closed off his hospital room, and, uh, and he was so sick that he had requested no visitors. Well, um, a agnostic named Bob Ingersoll uh, called and heard that he was in the hospital, and he called and, and asked if he could go see him. And they said, sir, uh, I'm sorry, we're not allowing any visitors in, but we will let the patient know that you called. And when Dr. Brooks heard that Bob Ingersoll called, he said to his doctors, please, I've got to see him. I've got to see him. And uh, they called him and let him know that he could come, and Mr. Ingersoll came to the hospital room. And... Bob Ingersoll looked at Dr. Brooks and he said, Dr. Brooks, I don't understand. Your doctor said that you didn't need any visitors. You had said that you blocked off your hospital room from having any visitors. Why were you so insistent about seeing me? Listen to what he said. He said, Bob, all of my loved ones, I'm confident that I will see them in glory. But this might be my last time to see you. This might be my last time to see you. Well, we're looking today at a story about Matthew. This is a true story. This is a story that happened with one of Jesus' followers and how this man named Matthew, also known as Levi, came to follow and trust the Lord Jesus Christ. This story is recorded in three of the gospel accounts. It's also in Mark chapter 2 and in Matthew chapter 9. I also want to share with you that Jesus saved two in particular tax collectors in his ministry. One was Matthew who stayed with Jesus throughout the remainder of his ministry. Another was Zacchaeus. Now you remember Zacchaeus from a little child. Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and said, Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm going to your house today. You remember that? Well, Zacchaeus was also a tax collector. And tax collectors uh, during this time were looked at as evil people. Matthew was a tax collector for the Romans. The Romans had actually recruited him to be a tax collector for them. Now, here we see the word uh, 
publican also used. And we have heard them called, referred to as sinners. The word publican here actually means a tax farmer. In other words, like a farmer would plow a field and plant crops and really invest his life in his crops. Well, this man, Levi, Matthew, farmed and invested his life in tax collecting. Now let me go a little further and tell you practically what that means. Again, here's the reason why tax collectors were called sinners, looked at as being evil people. It's because that the Romans allowed them, in order for them to make money, they could go up to somebody and say, hey, your taxes are due, and I'm charging you, and they'd throw out a number which was way above what the Romans required the people to be taxed. And they would give the Romans their share, and they would keep the rest, taking the hard earnings of the people that they were collecting from. That's why they were looked at as evil people. That's why they were called publicans and sinners. Everyone hated Matthew, apparently, because we see Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom, which was a, the main tax place where everybody came to. And because he was sitting there, he must have been a very formal tax collector. Everybody had to know it. And also this means that he was probably very wealth, wealthy, which means he probably cheated some more than most other tax collectors. He was an evil person everybody looked at. But he had probably heard Jesus preach. He probably had seen what Jesus was doing all through Israel. And Jesus had already caught the attention of Matthew. And so today, Jesus walks up to Matthew. His heart is softened. He's ready to hear the gospel, and Jesus looks at him and says two words. Follow me. Now you've got to understand what that meant to Matthew. What that meant to Matthew was probably, hey, it's time to change my life. I've seen him change the lives of others. I've seen him take evil and, and change it to good. I've seen him take a, uh, a person who was lame and make him walk again. I've seen him take a person who was blind and make him see again. I've seen him take someone who was uh, paralyzed and make them up and jump again. I've seen someone who couldn't talk, talk again. I've seen what Jesus can do in their life. And so now he's coming to me at my table wanting to do something in my life. And so when Jesus said, follow me, that's why he could get up and just leave all and follow him. It's because he recognized that he was looking at the only one that could change his life. Matthew had denied his Jewish heritage and he now served the Romans. But Jesus came to make a difference in Matthew's life. And I want to talk to you about uh, three things this morning. First of all, I want you to notice the iniquity invading my house. The iniquity invading my house. The word iniquity is another word for sin. Look again at verse 27. And after these things, he went forth and saw a publican, tax farmer, named Levi, sitting at the receipt of custom, and he said unto him, Follow me. Why would Jesus need to go up to him and say, follow me? Because again, he was an evil man. Why do, why do you sit here today and why do you need preaching? Because we've got things in our heart and in our body that only Jesus can correct. We need the preaching of the Word of God. You know, I'm firmly convinced that nothing's going to change this country except the preaching of the Word of God. I don't believe the answer is going to come through uh, the White House. I don't believe it's going to come through a political party. I don't believe it's going to come through our nation having more money. I believe the only thing that can change this nation is the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I think Jesus is the only one that can make the difference. And so Jesus walks up to him being the only man that can make a difference in his life. But there was iniquity invading his house. Jesus saw a man who needed a Savior. And you may be here this morning, and you may not know whether you're going to heaven or not. You may not know whether you're saved or not. Maybe you know if you died right now, or if Jesus came back in the clouds, and the saved rise to meet the Lord in the air, you'd be left behind. Or if you died right now, you'd open your eyes up in a devil's hell. 
Maybe you know that. Well, Jesus is knocking on your heart's door and He says, Hey, I know you're a sinner, but I'm willing to forgive you of that sin. I'm willing to take my blood that was shed on Calvary and wash it white as snow and make your slate clean. I'm willing to do that. Will you trust me? And all you have to do is say, God, I know I'm a sinner. And I'm sorry I've broken your law. I'm sorry I've broken your heart. I repent of my sins. I turn from my sins. And I trust you. I trust the cross. Forgive me and save me. And Jesus promised for whosoever, you're a whosoever. I'm a whosoever. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's not about what you can do. It's about what He did. All you have to do is accept the gift and you can be saved. The Bible refers to our bodies as God's temple. And there's sin living in there. And the only way to conquer that sin is to invite Jesus in and let Him clean you up. You say, well, preacher, I tell you what, I'm not going to be no stinking hypocrite. I'll clean myself up, then I'll come to Jesus. Don't work like that. You can't clean yourself up. You can't be good enough. You can't go to church enough to clean yourself up. You can't be baptized in that water and clean your life up. You can't do anything. If you accept Christ as you are, He'll spend the rest of your life cleaning you up and making you who He wants you to be. But you can't even start the process until you invite Jesus into your heart. Until you trust Him. So if you're not saved here, there's iniquity invading your house. You need Jesus. Now listen, if I have to do the preaching and the amen, and we're going to be here longer. We need Jesus. Amen? So we see the iniquity invading my house. Secondly, I want you to notice the inviting into my house. After Matthew trusts Christ as his Savior, he... Uh, Jesus says, follow me. And then he says, hey, Jesus, I want to set up a, an evangelism opportunity. But I don't want us to go out to a tent. I don't want to go into a church service. Here's what I want to do. I want to invite all my sinner friends to my house. And I want you to show up there. And Jesus says, you know what, Matthew? I think that's a good idea. So here, I want you to notice the inviting... To the Savior. After we're saved, we have the responsibility, just like Matthew found out, we have the responsibility to tell others about Jesus. In fact, that's what we're still here for. What were you created for? You, you weren't created for worship. You weren't created just to be good. You were created to have a relationship with God. But that relationship was broken by sin. And because that relationship was broken by sin, Jesus had to come and die on the cross to restore that relationship. So now there's nothing that stops you from going to heaven. But here's the thing. We're not in heaven yet. So why are we not in heaven if, if the purpose is accomplished? If we can have a relationship with Jesus and once we get saved, Jesus is in here, why can't we just automatically go to heaven? Because there's another mission that is more important. You listen to me. If you don't remember anything else I say, you remember this. There is a mission that God has for you that is more important than you being in heaven. And if that was not true, you'd be in heaven. So what is that mission? That mission is, there is somebody, I don't know who it is. It could be a family member, it could be a friend, it could be a co-worker. It could be somebody you haven't met yet. But there is somebody that God has planned for you and you and you and you and you and you personally and me to tell about Jesus. That's the purpose. Otherwise you'd be there, not here. There is somebody for you to tell about Jesus. Otherwise you'd be gone. Matthew realized that. And he invited all of his tax collector friends, all of his sinner friends, to come to his house and hear the gospel. 
We don't do this kind of thing anymore. I, I don't know what it is. I, I, I think sometimes we expect the preachers to do all the door knocking. I think sometimes we expect maybe uh, different groups in the church to do the work of the church. Here, here's the older saints. The older saints, well, I've done my time now. Let all the younger people do the work. The younger people are saying, well, the older folks, they've got more experience than we do. Let them do the work. Then some people are saying, well, hey, we hired a preacher. Let the preacher do the work. And there are preachers that are saying, hey, I'm, I'm studying, I'm preaching. Let, let the church members do the work. And here's what's happening. This group's saying, let this group do the work. This group's saying, let this group do the work. And ain't nobody doing the work. That's what we see going on. Folks, if you're here and you are a Christian, it is your responsibility to knock on doors and tell people about Jesus. It's all of our responsibility. I want you to notice here that Dr. Luke calls Matthew by another name. If you look at the other two accounts of this story, Matthew is called Matthew. But if you look at Dr. Luke's account, he's called Levi. You know what that word Levi means? It means to be joined. To be joined with. In other words, Matthew made a decision. I'm going to change my life and I'm going to join with Jesus. I'm going to become part of the family. You'll notice we say brother and sister around here. It's because we're a family. And these folks are so near. When one has a heartache, we all shed our tears and rejoice in each victory in this family so dear. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Joint heirs with Jesus as we travel this side, I'm part of the family, the family of God. That's why Matthew could leave all. He left all and abandoned all and left behind everything he knew for a new way, a new life, a new name, a new family to be joined with and to follow Jesus. There was this little pygmy and he had to go up against this pretty tall giant of a guy. And someone leaned over and asked the pygmy, said, uh, how are you going to defeat that giant? And that pygmy said, well, I'm going to use my club. And he said, well, how big is your club? He said, oh, I got about a hundred in my club. <laughs> you can't do a lot by yourself, but you can do a lot with the family. And the problem is why many churches are dying is because they're only expecting one or two or three people to do all the work. We need everybody. We're, we're bigger and better as a family. We can do more together than we can apart. And so, Matthew realized... I can do better if I invite my whole family, my new family, into my house and tell people about Jesus. So he invited Jesus. He invited Jesus' other followers. They all met there that day for one purpose, evangelism, to tell others about Jesus. And by the way, I want to get off on this and I'll move on. This is a very effective evangelism program and it's biblical. See, whereas sometimes we go out and knock on doors, and I believe in a knocking on doors because in the book of Acts, that's how they got thousands of people to join the church and to trust Jesus was by going from house to house, just knocking on doors, telling people about Jesus. But let me give you another thing that they did, and we see it right here with Matthew. The people that already had a house, they went out and looked for sinners, people who did not know Christ, people who had not heard the gospel, and said, hey, I want to invite you over to my house and I want to feed you. That's what Matthew did. I'm inviting you over to my house and I want to feed you. And while you're there, I'm going to share with you what changed my life. 
Why can't we do that? Why can't some of you sitting here do that? Why can't you plan a day where you invite your neighbors or maybe some lost friends of yours over to your house, cook them a meal and say, hey, I, wanna, I want you to come hear about someone who changed my life. Can't we do that? I want you to be thinking about that. And if you're willing to do something like that, we'll be glad to help you with it any way we can. But it's an effective way to reach people. Invite them into your home. Share the gospel with them. Dr. Billy Graham uses this uh, method with his uh, My Hope Billy Graham campaign. And uh, we have those uh, sermons, by the way. You can invite them over to your house, show them the Dr. Billy Graham's message about the cross or uh, the other two that he did. I can't remember the names of the other two right now, but amen. But if you want to show one of those videos, you can invite your friends, your uh, lost acquaintances into your home, show them that video, feed them, minister to them, and I guarantee you, you'll see people saved. How do I know that? Matthew was sure about it. And God believed in it so much that He put it in His infallible, inspired, and errant, perfect, holy Word. That way you could read about it 2,000 years later. God must have thought that it was going to work. Amen. Well, I'll move on. The inviting to the Savior. Secondly, the inviting to the sinner. I want you to see that Jesus went to where the sinners were. Sinners didn't feel unwelcome around him, uh, around him. Sinners shouldn't feel unwelcome around us. You can't expect a lost person to act like a Christian. You've got to love them. And you've got to show them what's so great about Jesus that way they will want a change in their life. But in order to get that message to them, they're not going to come looking for it. It's not naturally in them, the Bible says. We've got to bring it to them. And Jesus went to where the sinners were. Matthew wanted others to see the difference that Jesus made in his life. And we should want others, sinners, to see what Jesus has done in our life. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I've used the word sinner a lot. I'm not condemning uh, a certain group of people. We're all sinners. There's two kinds of people in the world. There's lost sinners and saved sinners, but we're all sinners. You say, well, you're a preacher. You're not supposed to be a sinner. Listen, I'm the biggest one out of all of you. I'm a sinner saved by grace. One day as a 13-year-old boy, Jesus came by my way and knocked on my heart's door. And he said, Josh, I'm here to save you. And I said, Lord, I want to be saved. And that day I got saved, and I know if I died right now, I know where I'm going. Woo! I'm going to glory to be with my Savior. I know that. But I'm a sinner that's been saved by grace. And I promise you, we're all sinners. And if you don't know Christ as your Savior, trust Him. Matthew wanted others to meet Jesus for himself. My last point, I'll be closed. We've seen the iniquity invading our house. We've seen the inviting into our house. Thirdly, I want you to see the illumination inside my house. Once Jesus showed up in there, what happened? Look at verse 30. But their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why, why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answered and said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I want you to know that there is a sickness that people have that don't know Christ. And the Greek word here for, sick, for the word sick is kakos. It's not just talking about a physical sickness. It's talking about a spiritual sickness. Let me tell you this, sin is a fatal disease. Sin is like cancer. In fact, I would even go so far as to say that sin is the deadliest type of cancer. There's no cure for cancer. There's no cure for sin other than Jesus. But here's the thing, there's a cure. There's a cure for all of us. There is a remedy for every sin-sick soul. There is a solution for all the pain and hurt and wrong 
There is a solution for all the problems deep inside. There is a remedy. And His name is Jesus Christ. How foolish it would be for someone to just walk by a cure for cancer and say, I think I'll just keep the cancer. How foolish it is for people who have the deadliest form of cancer, sin, and walk past Jesus and say, I don't need you. How foolish it is to pass up the cure. But why do some die in their sin anyway? Because they don't know that they're sick. They don't know they need a Savior because they're happy with their sin. And it's my job to preach that there is a cure, that we are sick, and we do need this cure. We need Jesus. The church is like a hospital. I remember one time I was uh, very sick with the, uh, the flu. And while I was sick, I was kind of stubborn. My brother Trey. And I said, you know, I'll, uh, I'll just wait. I'll get better. And I lay there and the flu got worse, worse, and worse. But finally I had 105 fever. And I was uh, in pretty rough shape. And I was still a teenager at this time. And my dad came over. And uh, I, I couldn't, I was so weak, I couldn't even walk. So he picked me up, put me in the car, took me to the hospital. I didn't know I was that sick. Folks, the church is a hospital in that way. There are people who don't know they're sick. There are people who don't know that they need the hospital, even if they don't want it. And it's our responsibility as the church to be the church. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. And it's time for the salt to be the salt. It's time for the light to be the light. It's time for the church to be the church. We've got to show the world, hey, we have got the cure and you need it. We have Jesus and you need Him. That is our responsibility. And so whatever we've got to do to, to accomplish that goal, whether we send somebody down to a group called the Mundaruku people, or whether we, in a Sunday school class, teach the gospel and disciple folks, or whether we sing songs about Jesus to folks, or whether we make cards and send them out and put the gospel in them, or whether we go door to door, whatever we've got to do to accomplish that goal, we have to get the message of Jesus Christ out Past these walls. We have to. There's a solution. There's a sickness, but there's a solution. And Jesus paid for that solution. He died on the cross for me and you. Was He guilty? In one sense, no. He was not guilty. He paid for my sins and your sins. We were guilty, but He took the punishment. But i tell you what He was guilty of. In the hall of judgment, they thought they'd sealed His fate, but only destiny was calling Him to a hill far away. Pilate said, Behold the man, I find no fault in him. If they could have just understood He was guilty of loving them, he was tried and convicted and sentenced to die for a crime no one understood. Yet they shouted, Crucify! Pilate said, One shall go free, so which man will it be? They cried, My Jesus has to die. He was guilty of loving me. There was no fault in Him. There was no legal ground. Yet God's precious holy lamb was nailed to a tree. If tender mercy was his only crime so that grace could be yours and mine, then Jesus was guilty of loving me. We need some Matthews in the church. Some people that will say, hey, come into my house and see what Jesus did for me. Evangelism is only one beggar. Telling another beggar where he found bread. That's all it is. Dan Arnold said the gospel has not been clearly preached if the hearer doesn't know that not to make a decision is a decision. 
You've got two decisions to make today. If you're here and you don't know whether you're going to heaven or not, you've got a decision to trust Jesus or not. But I know most of the people that I'm preaching to claim to be Christian. You've got a decision to make too. Your decision is you know lost people. You can come down here to this altar and pray for those that are on their way to hell. Does that not burden you? Does that not bother you that some of the people that you know are going to die and go to a devil's hell? Does it not burden you enough to come to the altar and pray for them? So you've got a decision. You can sit in your pew and just go through another invitation. Or you can come and pray for those that are lost. And you've got another decision. This week you can sit at home and watch TV. Or you can come up with a way to get the gospel message to someone who desperately needs to hear it. You've heard the choices. What will be yours? Let's stand.